Hi, I'm Jay, and this is my full review of the world's only remaining ocean liner, Queen Mary 2. This was my third voyage with Cunard. I previously went on Queen Mary 2 back in 2009 and Queen Victoria in 2016. I left Queen Mary 2 with a positive impression of Cunard, which led me to book in another cruise in the future on Queen Victoria. However, this was Dan's first cruise with Cunard, and we were really looking forward to it as I sold it to him as being a luxurious breakaway. Queen Mary 2 and Cunard as a brand promised to deliver fine food, impeccable service and luxurious surroundings. However, regrettably, those expectations were not met. And in this review, I'm going to explain why. Before I go into the details of our trip and the experience we had on Queen Mary 2, I'm going to talk about Cunard. As a company, she is very different to other cruise lines. The large mainstream cruise lines like Royal Caribbean, NCL, Celebrity, MSC and other Carnival brands are evolving their ship designs, onboard facilities and the experiences they can offer to their guests. In recent years, we've seen new or newly renovated cruise ships take to the seas with go-kart tracks, ice rinks, huge water slides, roller coasters and infinity pools and hot tubs on ships like Iona. Cunard is very different as they've stayed pretty much the same over their 180 year history. There aren't really any wow factors on board, and as impressive as the Art Deco and Edwardian designed lobbies and restaurants are on board their ships, you don't find yourself walking around the ships giving too many oohs and ahs. Cunard have decided to stick to their history and their heritage. Their tradition and speciality has always been to deliver impeccable service, fine dining and luxurious surroundings to their guests. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, if that's all they're offering in an age where competing cruise lines are developing their ships and onboard experiences to their guests at a rate of knots, and Cunard aren't, then they seriously need to walk the walk if they're going to talk the talk when it comes to those three values which they eagerly promote. One thing that is regularly overlooked is Queen Mary 2 is not a cruise ship, she is an ocean liner. There is not a passenger ship in the world I would rather sail on through rough seas, as that is what she was designed for. As an ocean liner, she was built for speed and comfort, and when you look at her impressive designs such as the breakwater barrier on her foredeck to protect her superstructure against phenomenal waves, she really does shout out to the sea, I'm coming, get out of my way. Queen Mary 2 is the only ship in the world to offer a regular transatlantic service running out of Southampton to New York and back again. This service usually takes place between May and October time before she heads to the Caribbean for the fall and then on to her world voyage in the new year. However, more and more cruise lines are offering transatlantic crossings in the form of reposition cruises, whereby ships conclude their summer season in the Mediterranean and make their way west to North America for autumn and winter. Reposition cruises tend to offer great value for money to the customer for a few reasons. First of all, the demand for these cruises is pretty limited, mainly because of the amount of sea days you have. On a two week reposition cruise across the Atlantic, it is likely you would only have three ports of call. However, this adds to the cheaper cruise fare you can expect from these cruises compared to others, as cruise lines aren't having to pay berthing fees, pilotage costs, tug services, and other taxes and charges incurred by docking. They can then pass a majority of these savings onto the customer, which keeps the cost down. However, now that so many reposition cruises are available and offered by various cruise lines at fair and competitive prices, that chucks massive competition at Cunard, making it all the more important that the transatlantic experience they're offering is superb and irrefutable that the very best way to cross the Atlantic is on Queen Mary 2. In this video, I'll tell you whether I think this is the case. We boarded Queen Mary 2 in Southampton as her first return to sea voyage since her world voyage was curtailed in Australia back in 2020 because of the pandemic. Embarkation was pretty smooth, certainly better than the last couple of times I've been with Cunard. Once we had done our Covid tests in the terminal, we proceeded through security, then to the health declaration desk where they asked a series of questions, then we had to wait for our test results to come through. Once they had come through to our phones, we proceeded to check in and it was up the air bridge and onto the ship. We had a really nice welcome when we stepped onto Queen Mary 2. They clapped us on and were full of smiles. Certainly didn't get that with Morella on P&O, that's for sure. 
And if first impressions are anything to go by, we hope that this was a sign of the standard of things to come. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. We arrived at our cabin, which was a Britannia Club enclosed balcony cabin on deck six, starboard side. The cabin was nicely appointed, decor was quite classy, the balcony was a decent size. However, we had to go to the purser's desk as the unit for the climate control wasn't working, to the point it was actually hanging off of the bulkhead. The casing for the interior door handle also came off as soon as we shut the door on entry to the cabin. So that was undoubtedly a disappointment. Another disappointment came shortly after embarkation when we learned that the thermal suite and hydrotherapy pool were closed for the entirety of our cruise. We were not informed of this before boarding, which I thought was really poor customer service, as the spa is a major onboard facility. And when we're talking about a crew sailing in the end of November around the English Channel, it's probably the sort of cruise where passengers like us are going to want a spa. To rub salt into the wound, all swimming pools and hot tubs on board were covered for the whole duration of our cruise, including the indoor pavilion pool on deck 12. It was open briefly on day two, but the hot tubs were not. On complaining to the purser's desk, we were told that the pools at the aft were under maintenance, which didn't come as a surprise to me, to be honest, as they were incredibly grotty and uninviting, and the indoor pool and hot tubs were closed because the pH levels were wrong. I really was quite alarmed at the state and condition of Queen Mary II, and I'm sorry to report, it looks like Cunard have not been looking after her. The pool areas were grotty and incredibly unhygienic, Decking was marked and filthy, sun lounges were stained and incredibly worn, and the teak decks and exterior timber stairwells were verging on being rotten. The fact she went in for a dry dock and refit only a matter of weeks before this cruise, I'm not entirely sure what they did to her. These are not the luxurious surroundings I was expecting from Cunard. On to dining. Shortly after boarding, we went to the Golden Lion pub and had lunch. And I'm glad to say that the standard of the food and service there has not slipped since my last visit on Queen Victoria in 2016. The service was very attentive and friendly and the fish and chips and chicken tikka masala we both had were pretty good. However, come the evening we went to the stunning Britannia dining room. On previous Cunard cruises I've been on, as someone that doesn't eat meat I've been offered a separate vegetarian menu. However, that has disappeared, certainly on this night anyway. I had the mushroom and parmesan risotto to start, which was nice, but nothing to write home about. And I had the cod and orzo pasta for a main, which was edible, but certainly nothing I'm going to remember and think, yeah, that was a banging dish. Our experience at the King's Court buffet was okay, and it has much improved since my last trip on Queen Mary 2 back in 2009. The buffet is huge and takes up most of the deck area on deck 7, and the range on offer was pretty extensive. You also have the King's Court Speciality Restaurant in the evening, which is $25 per person, however we didn't get to experience this. Another section of the buffet area is Chef's Galley, a small eatery serving freshly made pizza and pasta, both of which were yummy and the service was friendly. Not the best Italian I've had at sea, but no complaints either. We now come on to afternoon tea. We had both the traditional afternoon tea in the Queen's Room, which Cunard are famous for, and the extra charge Godiva afternoon tea at Sir Samuel's. Regrettably, neither were without complaint. The Godiva afternoon tea was $15.50, and that bought one chocolate brownie, one scone, and two chocolates. Incredibly overpriced, especially when I think about Eric Landlard's afternoon tea on P&O, and the great musical afternoon tea on Morella, which were around the same sort of price. By comparison, this was taking the mickey, and we also had to ask for milk, sugar, jam, and we didn't get the milk chocolates that we asked for. Yet another disappointing experience when it comes to service. The traditional afternoon tea in the Queen's Room is something Cunard have been long famous for, and up until this cruise, I understood why. However, I'm sorry to say that the afternoon tea we had on this trip was memorable for all the wrong reasons. Service was really quite slow. It took an age for the sandwiches to find their way to us, and once they did, the bread was as dry as the Gobi Desert, and I wouldn't have said that the fillings were much better than any old sandwich filler you could pick up at Tesco. They then brought cakes and desserts around, 
From glancing at a tray, I could see that there was English fruit cake, key lime pie cheesecake, a chocolate gateau, and a couple of other cakes. All I asked was, are there any which aren't suitable for vegetarians? The waiter replied that he didn't know and would find out. 20 minutes later, at which point most people were on to scones, the head waiter came over and brought me a packaged mass-produced Mr Kipling cake. Firstly, with the service Cunard are so keen to promote as exceptional, the waiter should have been briefed so they could answer a simple dietary question. Secondly, I can't accept that every dessert on that tray had meat in it. And thirdly, why on earth couldn't I have a cake made by the chefs on board like everybody else? To think that Cunard are famous for this afternoon tea experience is laughable now. I've honestly had better at the cafe in my local garden centre and there wasn't a packaged cake in sight, I can tell you that. Concluding dining on a high, our evening meal at the veranda was one of the best meals I've had at sea. Absolutely exceptional. We didn't pay for this meal as it was booked for us as a gesture of goodwill for the issues we had in our cabin, but it should have been $45 per person, which is certainly on the high side of additional charge restaurants. But having tried it, I would be prepared to pay $45 each for the meal we had. We shared some maple and sea salt brioche bread and freshly whipped butter first, which was the best bread I've ever eaten, no exaggeration. I had a Caesar salad and then I had a Beyond Meat burger with halloumi and onion rings in a brioche bun, served with truffle and parmesan french fries and homemade ketchup. The best burger I've ever eaten, hands down. For dessert, Dan had the salty caramel and chocolate skillet cookie dough, which was as rich as Elon Musk, but undoubtedly one of the best desserts I've ever tried. And I had the strawberry and pink champagne pavlova with champagne sorbet. Impressive to look at and sensational to eat. If you go on Queen Mary 2, stump up the extra and book a table at the veranda. I would rank it as one of the best, if not the best speciality dining venues I've experienced at sea so far. That leads me on to pricing. I think Cunard are far too expensive and I don't think they offer good value for money either. Firstly, you tend to pay more for your cruise fare than you would for the same sort of cruise with p Royal Caribbean and Princess, etc. Yes, you get some extras like complimentary shuttle buses, free room service and some sparkling wine upon embarkation, but not much else. And when you do get on here, prepare to be astonished at the prices. A cocktail on here with the 15% gratuity on top ranges between $14 and $18. Although the cocktails are some of the best I've had, like the all-consuming passion in the Commodore Club, I think the drink prices are through the roof. I could pinpoint many areas where I think Cunard are overcharging their guests, but an area which really raised my blood pressure was Wi-Fi. I got off p and Iona the day I boarded Queen Mary 2, so I know that they use the same app, same satellite internet provider, and let's face it, they're practically the same company. P&O were charging £12.50 for 24 hours usage, which included use of social media, WhatsApp messaging, emailing and browsing. On Cunard, it's $15 for 30 minutes. That, to me, is a classic example where Cunard are clearly overcharging their guests unnecessarily, as I can tell you that their sister company are charging around the same price for 24 hours worth of internet. It's verging on insulting, and I think their internet packages are nothing short of dire. Extortion is a strong word, but I use it for this reason. The day before the end of this cruise, we were informed by Cunard that the British government had changed their testing requirements and the lateral flow tests required to be taken on our return home were now unusable, and we had to book PCR tests for our day two return. This would mean that the passenger locator forms filled out before sailing were now defunct and everyone would need to fill in new locator forms online to input the new PCR test reference numbers. Now, Dan and me are young. We're lucky that we're pretty savvy when it comes to technology. However, we were disgusted to see that Cunard were not offering much in the way of support to their guests in booking PCR tests and filling in new passenger locator forms. Let's face it, much of Cunard's clientele is elderly, many of which don't have smartphones. Most of those I had spoke to got family back home to fill in the locator forms and book tests, etc. 
many people on board now found themselves in a situation where they were either forced into paying $15 to use the internet to meet these new government requirements, or they had to get off and wander ashore to find somewhere where they could use internet. Very little support was offered in filling out the forms either, meaning 30 minutes of internet was often not sufficient as more minutes would have need to have been purchased. This to me is extortion, and I think Cunard would have earned some respect from me if they'd waived the internet charge to allow guests to meet the new requirements set by the government and offer support to the elderly in booking tests and filling out mandatory online forms. I was shocked. Let's talk entertainment and things to do on Queen Mary 2. Without a shadow of a doubt, things to do is very much aimed at the older ages. Most of the activities throughout the day include line dancing, yoga, enrichment classes and guest speakers, etc. There is very little for those of a younger age, which is why we were so angry that the spa, swimming pools and hot tubs were closed for the entirety of our cruise. And it meant we were actually quite bored at certain parts of our cruise. However, an area which does deserve recognition is the Illuminations Planetarium. It is very impressive. Shows last around 30 minutes. They are incredibly educational. The seats are comfortable and surprisingly for Cunard, it was free. However, it was a shame that there were no showings on the first or last day of our cruise, meaning there was just one day to see the show, which meant that many people missed out and were very disappointed. Another thing I'm going to mention before wrapping up this video is the ship's layout. I hate it. It is the most bizarre and ridiculous layout I've ever seen on a ship. So many parts of this ship are only accessible by certain stairwells or you have to go up and down to get to other venues. For example, if you want to get to the Queen's Room and you're on Deck 3, you have to walk down through the Art Gallery on 3L and then back up to 3 to find the Queen's Room. The amount of times we found ourselves walking through the Britannia Club dining room because we forgot that we couldn't access the Grand Lobby on decks 2 and 3 without going to the midship stairwell, you wouldn't believe. Most ships are pretty similar in layout, and you can have a good idea of where things are going to be. For example, buffet restaurants are usually on an upper deck at the aft, not taking up a majority of deck 7. Weird. So yeah, not a fan and I can't believe that many elderly guests on this ship are a big fan of it either. Cunard still operate a three-class system on board, in the form of Queen's Grill Suites, which is basically first class, Princess Grill Suites, which is second class, and Britannia Club accommodation, which covers all cabins from insides through to balconies. We had a standard balcony, so we were practically steerage, but I thought it would be important to highlight what you actually get for your money if you're a Queen's Grill or a Princess Grill guest. So obviously, you get a nicer and larger accommodation, a butler service, champagne on arrival instead of sparkling wine. They also get a fully stocked chargeable mini bar, afternoon canapes on request, a couple of hours of internet usage, access to the Grill's Lounge, entry into the Queen's Grill and Princess Grill restaurants, access to the top forward-facing tier in the Royal Court Theatre, and you have a private sunbathing area. I have to say, I think what Cunard offer their sweet guests is awful. When I look at the likes of Celebrity, everyone gets inclusive drinks, gratuities are included, you get free Wi-Fi. On Cunard, even the sweet guests don't get this. A sweet guest not getting inclusive drinks, what the hell is that all about? On Celebrity, sweet guests have access to a private sunbathing area too, it's called The Retreat. It's absolutely stunning and enough to entice me to save up so I can experience all the perks you get as a sweet guest, and not having to worry about paying for Wi-Fi, gratuities and drinks, etc. Celebrity even give you onboard spend and shore excursion credit. But anyway, let's see the Grills Terrace on Queen Mary 2. Doesn't scream luxury, does it? I don't think I got value for money in Britannia Club accommodation, but I'm pretty sure I'd feel like I'd received even less value if I'd spent thousands of pounds on a suite and didn't really get anything beyond a tatty sun lounger, a plate of canapes and a thumping great bill for gratuities at the end of the cruise. When that long anticipated day arrives where I'm in a financial position to book a suite, I won't be doing it with Cunard. I went on board Queen Mary 2 with such high expectations. 
and I walked away feeling really deflated, uncertain about Queen Mary 2 as a ship and very confused as to what Cunard now stands for as a brand. In the start of this review, I spoke about Queen Mary 2's main purpose, which is to do the transatlantic service for much of the year. Up until this cruise, if someone told me they wanted to do a transatlantic crossing and wanted advice on how they should do it, I would have said do it with Cunard and on Queen Mary 2, as Cunard are the experts in transatlantic crossings and Queen Mary 2 will offer the best transatlantic experience. However, I don't feel that way now. Having seen the experience Cunard gave me, I'm very confident that other cruise lines would have given me a better one. The food with the exception of the veranda was pretty mediocre. Service was no more exceptional than what I received on Morella, Princess and P&O this year. I didn't feel like I was surrounded by luxury as the ship was very grotty in places and in need of TLC. And to top it off, Cunard is incredibly overpriced. They make you pay through the nose for everything. And when you're not getting that luxury and impeccable service they promised me when I booked this cruise, I for one don't feel like I'm getting good value for money. So I for one would choose a different cruise line to take me across the Atlantic. Yes, Queen Mary 2 is a transatlantic liner. Yes, she's stunning to look at. But basing my decision on my most recent experience on Queen Mary 2 and Cunard, I'm confident that other companies in the market would offer me a much better experience at a more competitive price. I've actually sailed across the Atlantic twice on both Britannia and Arcadia, and both of my experiences were pretty faultless, and a lot less than what Cunard would charge for a transatlantic on Queen Mary 2. I feel that if Cunard do not get their act together, they are going to fade into insignificance. There's nothing wrong with not following the crowd and putting all the big wow factors on their ships that other companies are doing, but they need to be exceptionally good at what they're selling, and I'm sorry, but they weren't this time round. Dan and me received future cruise credit from Cunard because of the various complaints we made, so we will give Cunard one last try, but we won't be going on Queen Mary 2 again for a while. I still maintain that Queen Mary 2 is the most stunning ship in the world. As my granddad would have said, many ships just look like blocks of flats today and don't even resemble the traditional appearance of a ship. You certainly can't say that about Queen Mary 2. She really does carry the torch for traditional ocean travel, and I hope that the issues that we experienced this time round have vanished by the next time we cruise with Cunard. So I do hope that you found this video helpful. I promise you that not all of our reviews are like this one, but it's important I give you a genuine opinion so I can help you make the right decision on booking your next cruise. Please give it the thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for future cruise content. And don't forget to click that bell icon to be notified when we post a new video each week. Thank you so much for watching and we look forward to seeing you next time.